Hello again, everybody. Um, it is my real pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague, Richard Ovenden, Bodley's librarian, for our final keynote of this tremendous conference celebrating uh, the 50th anniversary of the glorious Churchill Archive Centre. I feel Richard really will need very little introduction to this audience online and here with us at the college. But in the context of this conference, let me just highlight a couple of aspects of his achievements and contributions to our field. First, his role as president of the Digital Pres Preservation Coalition, which builds on how we ended the last session and the challenges of our future uh, archives in the digital world. But also, his extensive writing on the preservation and destruction of knowledge. His book, Burning the Books, A History of Knowledge Under Attack, was published in 2020, and it was a BBC Radio 4's Book of the Week and shortlisted for the Wolfson, Wolfson History Prize. And speaking personally, his coda in that book is a powerful manifesto for, in his words, why we will always need libraries and archives. Amen to that. Richard Offenden. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to say how honoured I am to be speaking to you this afternoon. And thank you all for staying after two very busy, very intense days and a beautiful Cambridge late September afternoon to tempt you outside. But so thank you for staying, staying with us. And thank you um, to Jess for her very generous words and also to Alan. And uh, I'd like to add my congratulations to him and to the college and to his colleagues here in the Archive Centre for the amazing work that they do. And by way of uh, congratulations, I, I bring you a few um, little gifts from my institution by way of uh, the presence of Winston Churchill in our holdings. Here's one um, with uh, Winston Churchill pointing a gun at the cabinet. Um, you get the joke. Um, Here's a, a, a very nice one uh, relating to, uh, this is from the Asquith Archive, um, relating to Gallipoli, of course, your major um, episode in, in Churchill's own history. Um, I love this cartoon, actually, from a Swiss newspaper, um, bringing the bulldog um, to, to the fore. And uh, perhaps my, my favorite of the a few things that um, I, I just pulled out of the stacks at random, um, here's, here's a very nice one about the dangers of um, controlling food in restaurants during World War II, a very, very dangerous policy which Churchill um, was anxious um, to, to stop in its tracks. <laughs> adding that, um, of course, he's entirely disinterested in the matter, as he, 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 he hardly ever goes to restaurants. So um, an example to all uh, you know, leading politicians everywhere to be as disinterested. Um, but my, what I'd like to do this afternoon is talk to you about um, the place, really, of research collections in research libraries and, by extension, research archives. I, I, you know, please think of the two as being um, coterminous, as it were. Um, I, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the kind of characterization of collections in our institutions at the moment, to think about the historical turn which I detect at the moment. And this is not a historical term in terms of scholarship, but in terms of the wider public interest. Um, and to think, to, to do some provocation about rethinking what should be in the stacks today and in particular in the future. And then to end um, picking up the theme, as Jess said, of the coda of my book on why preserving collections like you do here in the Churchill Archive Centre is important for society. And then to end on a bit of um, uh, a final, very small policy provocation around um, the archives of political leaders. 
So our st stacks in a library, that these just come from the Bodleian, but the, they could be many uh, research libraries or college libraries or uh, other collections of a similar kind, um, have built up these great legacy collections. And Chris Woods was talking about the impact of that on us today with the responsibility to preserve um, in the Bodleian, um, both in our ancient library and in our offsite storage facility. And the UL has a very similar one just uh, in Ely. Um, we have literally millions, in our case, tens of millions of printed items, um, whether they're printed books, journal art, uh, bound volumes of journals, maps, uh, you, you name it. And we've, we've built those collections up to make them um, accessible, and we put a lot of effort into, into preserving those. And that's, that's, that's absolutely right and proper. And again, as many of the speakers earlier were saying, that um, responsibility for preservation goes with a responsibility for access and so you know the the discovery services our online catalogues uh, and, and so on are absolutely crucial to making those collections live and uh, and work for our communities today but increasingly the collections that we acquire particularly those published and printed materials are online they are born digital they might have a, a printed um, manifestation but essentially the reading that's done from research libraries today uh, if you look at the volume is 90 percent online and um, that is a, a factor that isn't isn't really going to go away. But it, and it's not a, 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 a it's a quantitative judgment and not a qualitative one. But of course, the archives in our collections have not been transferred into that digital form, um, with the exception of you know, fabulous projects like the census and uh, and so on. Into that, into that digitized space nearly as fast. There's not been that um, commercial engagement at nearly the same level as there have been with the scholarly literature, particularly in the STEM subjects. And um, we've also, as a sector, been somewhat behind the curve in making those collections available online, even at the level of metadata and description and discovery services. This is our um, relatively new online archives catalog, which is trying to kind of address some of that uh, access uh, imperative. And of course, those physical archives that we have, and we have about 20 kilometers worth of shelving of that kind of material in the Bodleian, um, is also changing its nature at the moment. So what you find in the stacks, and um, uh, I, I think it was Mary who was referring to the kind of hybridity of collections, is that we have increasingly a hybrid form of uh, archival holding in our, in, in our stacks. This is one example, it's the Barbara Castle archive. She left us about 500 boxes of paper um, and two word processors. But she did not leave us the passwords for the word processors, <laughs> so my colleagues had to hack into them in order to take the data off that hardware and put it in a form which it can be sustained and passed and used, hopefully, in the future. And that's a kind of an increasingly significant problem. It's less of a technological one and more of a kind of societal, organizational one. And, you know, we see increasing uh, thoughts about digital wills, leaving passwords, and uh, even just the locations as people's own personal digital archives are not just on their laptops, um, they're in social media accounts, they're spread across Dropbox and other kind of file sharing systems. And actually just keeping track of it oneself is, can be hard, let alone leaving that for one's successors or, um, or, or, or family members after one ceases to be able to uh, access it themselves. And of course, for some of the larger organizational archives, the record transfers we have now from bodies like uh, Oxfam or the Conservative Party uh, are 
increasingly only in digital form. So this is what a record transfer from the Ar Oxfam archive looks like um, when it comes into the Bodleian today. So we have this kind of array of legacy print collections. We have hybrid archive collections increasingly with all of the pressures on um, how to process and preserve those hybrid collections, let alone how to make them accessible. Um, and th that, that sort of very high level, very, very crude um, survey of what's in our stacks today um, leaves me with just two, at this point, just two pleas to make, or re really it's just one plea, but I'll give two examples of it. And that is the importance of keeping boring stuff. So we quite often focus our attentions in public engagement and all of this great work on the kind of exciting, unique and rare material. You know, Winston Churchill's archive is kind of preeminent of its kind of excitement and so on. But the stacks of our great libraries are full of really boring stuff. But that boring stuff is really important, I think, for society. And I'll give you two examples. So one, these are actually stills taken from the film Spotlight. I don't know um, if you, you know it. It's actually a film about an investigative journalist team who exposed um, uh, child, uh, horrific child sex offences perpetrated by members of the Catholic Church in Boston. And it's a true story with journalists in Boston. And much of their detective work was spent in the stacks of the great libraries of that city tracking down really boring printed material, parish newsletters, um, all sorts of, you know, directory, diocesan directories, long since out of date. And they're the kinds of things which if I was showing senior leadership of the University of Oxford around the stacks of the Bodleian and they saw some of this stuff, they'd say, God, you've got to throw that junk out. They'd be horrified that we were keeping this kind of material. But it's exactly that kind of material that enabled those journalists to track the whereabouts, the movements of those uh, individuals who perpetrated those horrific crimes and were able to make a case which, you know, held water and eventually saw justice prevail. And similarly, in Poland, long since out-of-date telephone directories are being used today by teams trying to help Jewish communities be reunited with their lost, um, their stolen property. And telephone directories, parish newsletters, diocesan directories, these are, and particularly long since out of date ones, these are parts of the bedrock of knowledge about the past which don't have the great excitement of the, the, the you know, the, the letters of Winston Churchill or whoever, but enable um, scholarship to take place, but they also enable us to recover the past in ways which make significant, uh, are significantly important for society. And of course, at the moment, what we are also in a phase of in our society is unlocking the power of our stacks through digitization in order to make it possible for communities who can't afford to come to those reading rooms, the point that Chris Woods was making earlier, um, to access them um, uh, wherever they are in the world, whether they're just you know, here in another college in Cambridge or they're in, um, you know, or, or literally on the other side of the globe. And that kind of work is impo important not just to extend the reach of the collections that we've been lucky enough in our research libraries to be given or to acquire uh, and have put so much effort in preserving, but to, um, to make them available, in some cases, to the communities from which they originated. So to kind of give back to those communities in some way, shape or form. I'd like to pause a little uh, for a moment on what I detect happening more broadly in society about 
the use of history, and I'm sorry I missed the, the sessions yesterday. I'm, I'm sure they will have made much more sense than I'm about to. But it's a very kind of simple point, and one which I uh, detect happening um, in recent years, and it's around the issue of transparency in public life and around accountability and responsibility. And I think archives have an incredibly important and powerful place um, in uh, a society which is increasingly wanting to know what happened and who, under whose authority and who made the decisions and why. And in all sorts of areas of public life, particularly in perhaps in more recent history, um, that past is being sought to be uncovered, not purely for scholarly reasons, but more broadly for societal, uh, for societal reasons. And we see that, um, these are just a few um, screenshots from uh, online magazines and newspapers um, to, to, to drive home the point. And the, the, these, are, these are all kind of quite, quite recent. And you, you would kind of expect the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard to be um, wanting to show that they're informed by archives, but at least it's reassuring to see you know, leading scholarly institutions make that, make that claim. And then you see um, you know, programs like David Olashoga's A House Through Time, which um, I think is a bit, no, bit of a misnomer, because if you watch the programs, they're really about the documents that show what a house, um, you know, the occupants of a house through time. They're really heavily um, drawn from archival research. And I think also what we're seeing, and to some extent I've been surprised that it's not happened much more directly, is that in the, under the umbrella of social justice, a return to archives to uncover stories that have been told from one perspective for many, many generations, and the archives are available to tell a different story, or at least to be open to other interpretations. And I'll give you one example of those in my own institution, which is we have the archive of Cecil Rhodes. And Cecil Rhodes has been quite a prominent name in uh, social justice debates over the last decade. We obviously have the statue, um, a few minutes walk from the Bodleian outside Oriel College, which has been the focus of um, a, a great deal of uh, attention and protest and um, all sorts of interesting suggestions about how to reinterpret uh, Cecil Rhodes's place in history and in Oxford's history in particular. But the archive, actually fairly well catalogued in the Bodleian, um, has not actually, you know, we've not seen those campaigners go back to the evidence because there's, it, it's absolutely astonishing what is to be found there. Much of this has been happening by historians, however, um, and we've seen this uh, great um, period of new, histor new historical approaches, revisionist history, going back to archives and making new interpretations of them. And um, I, I think there's so much more to come on that. Quite a lot of that has been very critical and um, has surfaced new research topics. And I think increasingly um, many of the graduate students certainly that come to the Bodleian are interested in this area. And that's certainly something that um, in terms of public engagement, there are great opportunities here for connecting um, communities who have felt marginalized by the historical narrative to find that actually their stories are in the stacks of great institutions and smaller institutions as well, and that those new stories are there to be told. And certainly some of the work that we've been doing um, uh, around, uh, for example, uh, archives that relate to uh, Aboriginal communities has, has been very much in that spirit. And I think one of the most powerful examples of the way that archives can address some of these concerns has been the, the fantastic UCL project on the legacies of British slavery, which I think has um, really um, surfaced a whole range of debates and discussions, and for some 
organizations and individuals and families have caused them to um, you know, confront some uncomfortable um, histories of their own. And of course, that project was only possible because of uh, an archival holding, a major archival holding in the National Archives. And so there is um, that, that, that historical turn, I think, has both been because archives have been preserved and that they can be reinterpreted by new generations or new communities who haven't thought to uh, access those materials, but also um, where there is more to be done. There's more scope. There's more there uh, to be accessed. I'd like to spend a little bit of time now just sort of rethinking um, for the future what research libraries um, should be placing in their stacks. And I'm actually going to um, put that word stacks in inverted commas because I think increasingly they're not going to be physical stacks that you can walk into but digital ones. And again, I think we're at a moment in our history where that... Uh, society's memory is changing its format quite dramatically. This is a screenshot from the New York Times just a few weeks ago um, pointing this out. This is actually from a scholar in Denmark who has a, a major project around digital preservation. And um, Jess and I uh, and our colleagues in the legal deposit libraries have been very concerned for some time around the archiving of the UK web. Uh, this is a uh, now quite famous and rather outdated chart by our colleague at the British Library, Andy Jackson, in their web archiving team, showing the, uh, the loss rate of um, URLs in the British web space, um, which basically... The, the message is, if you want to preserve something, don't put it online. Um, and that message um, was also heard loud and clear about a decade ago when our colleagues in the Harvard Law Library did a survey on the website of the Supreme Court of the United States and uh, identified that no fewer than 40% of the web links on that website were broken and didn't lead you anywhere. Now, how important is it in an open democratic society that the laws of the land are available to its people? Well, in this case, as, it, uh, as the communication of those legal opinions had moved online, uh, a dysfunctional website does not serve a, a democratic society. And so web archiving becomes increasingly important in our age as we find that the permanence, the reliability of the web as a place where you can go and find information becomes less sure. And projects like the UK Web Archive and the change in the legislation in 2013 which enabled Cambridge and Oxford and the other legal deposit libraries to archive the UK web space um, has, has become uh, a, a, an absolutely timely uh, thing to do. But again, this is just the UK web space. It's very high level archiving. Uh, for certain subjects, we're able to archive in much more deeply, more frequently. We need to do much, much more. And the same is true of the services which are provided by what my colleague in Oxford, Timothy Garton Ash, calls the private superpowers. As we, as a society, move our communications to platforms which are privately owned by major corporations, we run the risk that if their business models change or their commercial imperatives change, that whole swathes of human knowledge can be removed at, uh, at, at a go. So users of Gmail have found this out, users of Flickr have found this out, users of Twitter are becoming increasingly concerned that um, their messages are, are, you know, could disappear at any moment. Um, but it's not just those company decisions that place human knowledge at risk. It's actually the users themselves. Now, Donald Trump, of course, 
basically managed his political dominance of the United States through an iPhone and a Twitter account. Um, but he also deleted a lot of his own tweets, or his staff deleted them shortly after being sent uh, in the early hours of the morning, often. And um, there was a kind of activist archivist group called FactBase who fortunately set up automatic screenshotting of his tweets so that an entire record of those um, is available. And of course, the great private superpowers don't have archiving in their business model. Um, and that's taken some libraries, like the National Library of New Zealand, to set up projects where asking New Zealanders to donate their Facebook profiles to build up an archive, uh, a kind of uh, crowdsourced archive in a way, um, hosted by the National Library of New Zealand Life as it looks from the perspective of Facebook. And the, the Bodleian and many other libraries are also becoming increasingly active in archiving um, social media, um, in our case, um, Twitter accounts related to the Ukraine uh, war, the invasion of Ukraine. And this is something that we do uh, you know, uh, not just for um, uh, to continue archival priorities that we've had in the physical form for a, a very long time, but also because historians are increasingly telling us that they, the risk of losing historical record, um, as um, the distinguished panel earlier were commenting, um, is increasingly visible to us all. And again, um, uh, this is not uh, an issue that's not just being faced in the social media world, but also in the other forms of communication, um, encrypted and otherwise, like WhatsApp. And I wrote an op-ed in November 2020 in the FT on the dangers of government by WhatsApp and how the 1958 Public Records Act really should be seen as being format neutral and apl uh, applicable um, to um, the use of WhatsApp and other um, uh, digital messaging systems by government. I, I repeated it in, the, in a red box in the Times in 2021. Uh, and then, of course, um, the whole kind of WhatsApp crisis um, it, uh, descended, um, ending the Johnson administration, it, it, it essentially. So I think there's another realm of that digital communication which needs to be in the stacks of research libraries and archives. And there's a whole range of other forms of digital knowledge, if I can put it, which are um, I worry about. And I think they're both a concern and an opportunity. And that is the kind of digital profiling that's made by companies who specialize in digital profiling. And they take... Um, they buy data sets from social media companies, from the big search engine companies, from other commercial players. This is all information that we've placed online for free by clicking on those boxes that say, I accept. And they then build up profiles of our online behavior, our, our digital lives, and they sell it for all sorts of reasons. Um, mostly to fire adver commercial advertising at us, but increasingly political advertising and other um, more troubling um, kinds of profiling and online surveillance. And finally, um, in the realm of scientific research, um, you know, our scientists produce immense amounts of data through their scientific experimentation and their scientific work, which um, they use quite rightly for their own research purposes, but um, increasingly preservation needs to be seen as part of that research life cycle so that those data sets can be shared and reused and that the benefit that has been put into the funding of that research can be seen over longer and longer periods of time. And not just for the reproducibility and those issues that we saw earlier about transparency so that people can go and verify um, uh, th that research independently, but so that it can be shared and reused and that value can be released over long periods of time. And, and again, I think 
you know, you can see the value of doing this by, by noticing that there are independent groups outside of formal institutional archives that are already doing it. They see the gap in the market, as it were. They see the l lack of action, and they're taking control themselves by trying to archive, in this case, segments of Twitter. So I think that places a challenge on institutions like the Bodleian and others to take up the slack in the archiving of this, of this, of this digital world. Uh, and I'd like to just also end by uh, just acknowledging, and perhaps I should have done this earlier in the talk, that there are also collections in our stacks at the moment which um, are hidden and that they are secretly, they have been secretly uh, pre access has been prevented. Um, in this case, the the the, the um, uh, you know the the so-called migrated archive held by the Foreign Office, which was only um, released into the public domain, transferred to the National Archives after a, a High Court judgment in 2011. So I, I I'd like to finish by thinking, just going over again why it's important to have things in our stacks and to preserve them and to make them available. Uh, and the most obvious of those is, is education, the ability to allow students and researchers to come and uh, create new knowledge by um, spending hours in reading rooms or in search rooms, calling material from physical stacks or downloading uh, articles online, or whether that's through public engagement activities um, with, um, you know, trying to encourage younger people to think about the preservation of knowledge and to support their own education. But I think libraries and archives like ours also bring other forms of knowledge into our society, into our communities. They bring a diversity of knowledge. Um, some of our libraries were the first in this, uh, particularly research libraries like the UL and the Bodleian, were the first to bring uh, languages like Chinese and Japanese into British society by placing them on the stacks so that scholars could come and use them centuries ago. And we have responsibilities to make that diversity available in, in, online through digitization. But that diversity of opinion, and I don't just mean other languages and cultures, but also um, challenging opinions in an age where freedom of, freedom of speech is increasingly uh, under attack. Libraries have a great role to play in uh, encouraging and allowing that diversity of opinion to flourish because it is a pillar of uh, an open democratic society. And also in an age where um, Kellyanne Conway, President Trump's press secretary, could come up with the idea that there could exist in the world alternate facts um, in defiance of the evidence that more people attended uh, President Obama's inauguration than had attended President Trump's inauguration. We must be reminded that that evidence is present in the stacks of our archives and libraries. And uh, being an Oxford person, I'm reminded by uh, Routh's great phrase when asked what advice he would give a young scholar, always verify your references, sir. And we take it for granted in places like the Churchill Archive Centre, the UL, or the Bodleian, that those shelf marks, those permanent URLs, those persistent identifiers are just part of our work, but they're absolutely crucial to combat disinformation and misinformation because we are sources of truth, we're sources of fact, and um, the, 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 those references, often centuries old now, those shelf marks, continue to persist, and they're an important touchstone in society. And um, this is one of my favorite quotes by a scholar using the Bodleian, where Hausmann, of course, the famous pedant, um, reviewing the work of a German classicist, discovered that his edition of Horace was missing a variant reading only found in one manuscript in the Bodleian. And he said, 
the arsenals of nemesis are to be found in the stacks of the Bodleian Library. Well, I think our challenge today in this digital world is how we replenish the, the arsenals of nemesis with that digital information out in the wild. And we mustn't think that this is um, a, a theoretical issue. I, I, I screenshotted um, this um, faked um, 18th century printed text from, uh, from Twitter or whatever it's called now, uh, just a few weeks ago, where, you know, circulating, purporting to be evidence um, uh, where, in fact, it's just a, a completely faked up piece of um, so-called history. Um, the third of my points is around... Uh, uh, sorry, the fourth of my points is around the rights of citizens. And again, um, the, uh, the presence of archives, the preservation of archives, um, a, a, as we saw with the, um, again, the Home Office's destruction of landing cards um, from the Windrush era shows us the value of archives, those, the, the accessibility of those archives by citizens being pursued by the Home Office's hostile environment could have been used to um, uh, protect their, their own rights. And we saw uh, after the invasion of Iraq in 2003, the wholesale removal of the National Archives of Iraq to the United States where it was digitized and uh, text and data mining was used to try and find evidence of weapons of mass destruction, but it created a hole in Iraq's history, which, um, uh, and many of those papers ended up in the archives of the Hoover Institution in Stanford, very difficult actually for Iraqis to access it, um, and, um, you know, uh, it, they have now returned to Iraq, but there's a whole uh, several generations who now need to rebuild, rewrite their own, their own history. And finally, there's the point about the identity of communities and society, where the removal of archives, we can see, shows their centrality to those communities and to society as a whole. Um, here's um, the, uh, a, a Jewish institution in New York called Yivo, um, unpacking documents from their archives um, which originated in the city of Vilna in Lithuania and only came to light after um, a Nazi horde was uncovered in uh, Offenbach in 1946 and eventually returned to their community. And we can see in Ukraine today where hundreds of libraries have been uh, damaged. Um, I think it's now um, more than 12 have been completely destroyed, uh, uh, and that's uh, uh, leaving aside in occupied territories where Russian troops are taking books in Ukrainian or about Ukraine out into the street and destroying them. So that eradication of a community of their own history and identity is happening, is happening right now. Uh, I'm going to end just on a, uh, a point about, um, it, it's actually about funding um, and uh, the, the policy point I'm going to make is, 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 is really about funding of political archives. And um, I sort of contrast this with the situation around presidential libraries in America where um, the National Archives in the States owns the archives of uh, former presidents, but they're placed in buildings and in foundations which are uh, philanthropically uh, supported, where there are kind of museums and educational programs. Um, so far, the Trump Presidential Library is just purely a virtual library uh, managed by the National Archives, um, but there are, I think, building projects in, in play there. But the Obama Presidential Center in Chicago is, um, is, is now kind of close to being the construction being started. And again, this is actually an interesting one because it's a purely digital library or a purely digital archive, 90% of the presidential records from the Obama administration are electronic and the 10% that aren't 
are being digitized by the National Archives to create a single digital library. Um, and as the custodian of seven prime ministerial papers, and I forget how many the church will, are you five or six or something? Well, three and a bit with one to come. Okay, so um, where we are not given um, government funding to look after those records. We have to resource the cataloging of them ourselves, the pr preservation of them, access, exhibitions, all education programs, all of that is a responsibility that we take on and finding the funding for it, as Alan and his colleagues know only too well. And I think it's time for a national policy to resource the history of our political leadership through resourcing its archives and particularly where we face that challenge of hybridity going into the future and all of the additional costs that coping with that hybridity are going to place on archives and libraries, that there should be um, serious thought given to uh, funding that, uh, perhaps in collaboration with the National Archives, but certainly to think about the funding to make those histories more accessible to the public um, uh, and, uh, yeah, um, I'm going to finish on this. Um, as I think uh, um, some of you ha have heard me uh, before um, uh, sort of channel George Orwell, who I think, although he was writing in the 1940s, seemed to be projecting um, on, on our current predicament. Um, and I, this is, I promise, my final slide. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you for listening and happy, happy to answer any questions. Okay, so I think we have a, a question down here. Uh, Frank King, uh, I really enjoyed that talk and what particularly struck a chord was your mention of the importance of keeping things which are boring. Uh, one thing in your extensive catalogue of items which are boring was missing, and that is advertisements. Ooh. I remember going into a provincial library, local library, with a friend about 50 years ago. We were looking into um, large buildings in the area, and the obvious thing to do was to look at old editions of Country Life, and they got bound volumes of country life going back years and years and years. In order to save space, they torn out all the advertisements front and back so that only the central part was left. Uh, and there wasn't a single advertisement. And you don't have to look at many issues of country life to see just how important the advertisements are. Uh, these days, advertisements are of a quite different nature. They're almost as... Um, things you don't notice or try not to notice by Google and all the rest of it. How are you going to preserve those? I don't know, but I do plead with anybody who has aspirations to be a librarian, when you're bu taking bi bound volumes of, of serials, for goodness sake, please keep the front and back because somebody will want to look at them sometime. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, do we have further questions? Piers. That was a wonderful talk and absolutely fascinating. And it's on, on the subject of boring stuff, um, David Kiniston is using precisely those boring materials to make riveting reading. And I think that's, um, that's a tribute to what you said and to, and to what you believe. My question, though, is a slightly different one. It's not how you preserve archives, it's how you destroy them. Um, one of the problems that I've got at the moment is that I'm reaching the end of my life and I've got to clear out my house so that I don't clutter up my house for my children and drive them completely insane. But the process of trying to do that is driving me insane <laughs> because I can't work out what I want to keep and what I want to get rid of. And physically um, getting rid of archives, deaccessioning as it's called, is a fiendish process as I... I uh, discovered when I was Alan's predecessor, how on earth do you do it? And, how, uh, and, and can digitization simply 
fill the gap. I, I believe in details, I believe in boring stuff. Uh, I, I, I think, um, as, as Gibbon said in his, his great book, it, you know, those who avoid details avoid difficulties. We need difficulties, we need details, but we don't need to be cluttered up. How do we stop that? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, uh, on, the, on the question of, you know, digitise and then throw away the physical, I tend to be uh, not in favour of that um, because, you know, having been involved in digitisation for a very long time, um, inevitably people think, oh, we're going to digitise at the highest resolution we possibly can, and there will be no need for us, if we do that, there will be no need for us to go on and re-digitise things. So uh, uh, how many times I've heard that through my career where people have then said, well, but actually I need to see the original because your scans don't capture this quality, the colour, or you don't go into the margins enough, or, um, you know, this particular page is blurred, or wh whatever it is, it's, it's never a replacement from consulting the physical original. Um, however, I, 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 you know, we do face headwinds in our profession, which are around uh, the cost of storage, whether that's physical or online, or, or digital storage, and the environmental impact of that. So I think, you know, we, we do have to make difficult decisions. I, I, I happen to think that the, particularly if we adopt the kind of passive environmental conditions that Chris was talking about, we can avoid many of the um, uh, energy cost of storing physical archives. I think we've got a long way to go to the energy cost of storing digital archives. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, for the library and archive sector, its consumption of energy and carbon and space is minuscule compared to the amount of energy that online shopping from Amazon alone takes up. It's, you know, it doesn't even register on their scale. So I think we've got to put all of these things in perspective, and I think we have to argue to policymakers, to government, to our local politicians, to our local decision makers and budget holders, that this is a, actually, in the relative scheme of things, a small investment for a, a, a very much longer term gain over many generations, and it's, uh, perhaps I should have put this in the talk, but I think there is also, at the moment we're in now, so much concern around intergenerational fairness. You know, we were able to buy properties relatively cheap, com certainly compared to um, what my children are facing now. And, you know, there are pensions, all other things around intergenerational intergenerational fairness. And I think there's an issue around intergenerational fairness around access to knowledge into the future. I think we run the risk of losing so much um, if we're not careful and if we don't work with industry and with um, commerce and with other aspects of society to preserve the reasons why the world is as it is today. We have a question here. Well, really more of a comment. I'm just uh, David Wollner from the Roosevelt Institute, so I'm involved in one of the nonprofits that supports a presidential library. Uh, I just, from my own knowledge, um, and this may be, you may be aware of this already, uh, and I don't know if it would be useful or not, but the presidential library system, actually, the archival component is supported by the government. Um, the, the buildings themselves are, the money is raised privately. But all of the public programming, and this includes the educational component, uh, is supported by ticket sales uh, to you know, the exhibits that exist and so forth. So there is a kind of hybrid uh, model here where they, you know, there is some private money involved. And there is a, a, some tension as well um, between the nonprofits who support the institution and the, uh, the National Archives, which is supporting the, the archival component. And there's always been a bit of a tension, and of course Franklin Roosevelt was the one who came up with this idea of a presidential library. Uh, every once in a while, the National Archives says, well, maybe we should just quit this presidential library business <laughs> because, you know, it's, it involves a certain complicated process of, of uh, putting these libraries, in some cases, in very obscure locations. So, uh, you know, there, there has been talk about the digitization 
kind of removing the need for the presidential libraries altogether. And that's one of the, the big uh, challenges facing the whole system, I think, right now in the United States. And President Obama, in particular, was not particularly interested in having a, quote, traditional presidential library. And a lot of the historians in the country were kind of upset because they felt he, he was putting at risk the presidential library system. Most, most historians, you know, they prefer the, the system because it, the sense of place, the, the way, it, much like here, the, the Churchill archives, there's a tendency to bring things together around the administration and so forth, which is quite different than, say, going to a big national institution like the National Archives in, in Washington. So um, it's not without its tension. Yep. And we'll have to see what, what happens in yeah. the future. But digitization is also having a big impact on the presidential library system in the United States. Sure. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, I note, um, I mean, two, two comments back. One, one is just, uh, for me, seeing the power of those presidential libraries is, is reading Bob Caro's Linda B. Johnson biography uh, and, you know, the famous phrase, turn every page, you know, sort of that sort of dogged, attention to detail, creating some of the, you know, I think the finest American history of, of recent times. And then I also note with interest in the Obama Presidential Center, so there is going to be a physical building in Chicago, um, but it is actually going to have a, bran a, a public library branch inside the building. So uh, it's a new development, absolutely. Now, I'm conscious of the, uh, of the time, because I know, Richard, you've got a, a, a taxi waiting shortly. Um, so I'm going to exercise my prerogative as organiser to, to ask a question. And it's one that links to some of the things, I think, that we were talking about earlier. In your presentation, when you were talking about social justice, and you were talking about your surprise, in a way, that more people weren't making use um, of the collections and the archival collections in the Bodleian for this. I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about what you think the barriers are to those people and what strategies you might want to put in place to overcome them. Um, so it was a comment less around the historians, more around the campaigners. So, you know, there's a group in Oxford called Rosemast Fall Oxford. You know, they, they um, in the summer of 2020, they marched outside the statue of Cecil Rhodes on the high, great number of placards, um, very sort of moving uh, demonstration. They left all the placards underneath the, um, underneath the, the, the statue. And the next morning I, I contacted Oriel College to say, please don't throw away the, the placards. So we have those in, in the archive, with the permission of Rosemont School, Oxford. Um, but, I, I, so, you know, plenty of historians have used it, but actually the campaigners themselves, I think, have not found their way to the archives. And maybe it's, it's too boring, you know, the, the, the finding aids, our finding aids are pretty dry on the whole. Uh, we actually have a project at the moment sort of, you know, looking at that, how to make them, um, how to draw out the, the richness of those collections. Um, and I think there's more that can be done through public programming and exhibitions, and certainly we've done a few small uh, exhibitions, and we're using the blog posts um, at the moment uh, around, which are connected to this, the anniversary of the Anti-Slavery Society, whose papers we have, and, and related other organizations, including the anti-apartheid movement. So um, I, I think there's more that we need to do. It's you can't just build it and they'll come. You've actually, uh, I think that's the point that Jessamy was making very powerfully, that you've got to be where the, where the people are. So we need to do more, um, or we need to make more of an effort. I'm talking about not, you know, my institution needs to make more of an effort on that. Well, Richard, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming and returning to Oxford um, in, in a day. It's uh, hugely pre appreciated. Um, so really, that is all, folks. Um, huge thanks to, to Richard. And, and I'm be very happy to, to have a conversation with you and perhaps with the University Library, which um, have at least one, pri well, have one prime ministerial um, collection um, about um, how we might go forward together in, in, in seeking more funding. Um, Definitely up for that. Um, 
It really falls on me now just to, just to say a, a word of thanks, not just to Richard, but to all our, our speakers. I mean, I think, you know, everyone has been absolutely wonderful. It, it's been such a fascinating, diverse um, um, range of speakers. Um, we have been streaming it live. We have also been recording it. Um, so with the speaker's permission, we will be putting it all up on the college YouTube um, channel. Um, but of course, None of this could have happened without the, the, the wonderful Archive Centre team who you've all seen sort of um, working behind the scenes to, to, to keep this running. And indeed to all the supporting college teams, to the porters, to housekeeping, to, to catering, and especially the unsung heroes of this conference who are the AV team um, up in the, the booth up there. Because this... because this was really quite a complicated um, um, one for them. It does seem wrong to single out any individuals for thanks, but um, I want to make one exception. Um, I don't think she's in the room at the moment, um, but it's to Amanda, the Archive Centre Administrator, because without here, um, none of you would have had rooms and none of you would have had anything to eat. So um, I think we should record our thanks to her. <laughs> And really, thank you all for coming. Um, there is yet more tea and coffee over in the buttery for, for those of you who can stay a little while yet, and we can um, finalise the discussion. But thank you all very much. Um, we're going to play out with a 50th anniversary um, video, I think. Uh, here we go. Happy 50th anniversary, Churchill Archive Centre. Happy 50th anniversary, Churchill Archive Centre. Happy 50th anniversary, Churchill Archive Centre. Happy 50th anniversary, Churchill Archives Centre. Happy anniversary, Churchill Archives Centre. Happy 50th 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 anniversary, Churchill Archives Centre. So happy 50th anniversary to Churchill Archive Centre. Yay! Happy 50th anniversary, Churchill Archive Centre.